Well, let us turn then to the Persian invasion that culminates in the Battle of, Ma of Marathon. The purpose is very simple. <clears throat> Sorry. To punish those cities that have uh, insulted and damaged the great king, Athens and Eretria. To restore Hippias to the tyranny in Athens and where, from where he can serve as the king's satrap. <clears throat> and surely also to gain a foothold in Greece on the way to conquering <clears throat> all of Greece. <clears throat> Why should he want to conquer all of Greece? Herodotus tells a story about <clears throat> his relative who tells him, for God's sake, why do you want to go to Greece? There's nothing there but a lot of rocks. What is the point of conquering the place? It's one thing to conquer all of these rich places, Egypt, Babylonia, that's fine. There's wealth there, there's huge populations, there's a lot of good stuff. It's just Greeks and rocks. Why in the world do you want to go there? And the answer, I think, in part would be uh, Sir Edmund Hillary's answer, because they're there. <clears throat> and that's part of the answer, because, you know, we must understand that the ancient idea, in fact, I'm willing to say, the idea that dominated thinking about such matters right down probably into the 19th century in many cases, but certainly before the advent of Christianity, was this, that conquest is good. It's good to be strong. It's good to be rich. It's good to be powerful. Therefore, it's good to be stronger, richer, and more powerful. And if there's somebody on your frontier, take them over. And that, by the way, will make you still more glorious because conquest is glory. <clears throat> now we, in the West, that's not our natural attitude. Our natural attitude is shaped in considerable part, whatever your uh, religious association may be, by Christianity, which has been the dominant force in shaping people's thinking uh, in the West, whatever, as I say, whatever religion you belong to. And that aspect of Christianity that it violates is the one that's increasingly the one that's emphasized <clears throat> by Christians, and that is the Sermon on the Mount. The, the one that says the meek shall inherit the earth, not the strong and the tough, and so on. And the one that says if your enemy strikes you, turn the other cheek so he can strike you there too. Now if the Greeks had heard that, they would have said, these people are lunatics, send them away. Greek morality said, be good to your friend, do good to your friends, and harm to your enemies. And the second part is just as important as the first part. So you need to understand that the sort of the ethical underpinnings to all of our natural thinking in, in the West are as odd and strange and crazy as they can be for everybody else in the human race, so far as I can see. There are exceptions. I'm, I'm missing some uh, Eastern religions which have ideas that are not altogether anathema to what I'm saying. But what I'm trying to say is nobody in the ancient world would have ever had such an idea. Of course, if you can conquer somebody who's your neighbor, you do. And so there was every reason to know that the, the Persians were coming. Um, How many? We don't know. The estimate that most people would accept is somewhere between 20 and 30,000 <clears throat> infantrymen. So for the sake of splitting the difference, I always assume something like 25,000 infantrymen. And some cavalry. That's very important, even though the cavalry does not play any part in the actual Battle of Marathon. But <clears throat> Herodotus makes it very clear that there was a Persian cavalry that the Persians picked the site of Marathon to fight in, in part because it was a good place for cavalry to fight. So there's a Persian cavalry on board the ships anyway, alongside the infantry. The two Persian generals are Datis and Artaphernes. Um, they have with them Hippias. Hippias, of course, must have been all these years urging the great king to make some such uh, campaign, and he probably would have said, and Marathon is the place to land. You remember? That's the territory of the Pisistratids. That's where Pisistratus landed on his last uh, return to Athens when he made himself tyrant. That's where his people were. That's where his forces would gather. I'm sure Hippias said, 
what all such exiles always say, all I need do is set foot on the beach at Marathon and my people will rise up as one and join me. You won't even have to fight in Athens because they'll be so glad to see me back. This is what King James, I'm sure, told uh, Louis XIV about getting back to England and one hears that all the time. <clears throat> Uh, but it, it's a very important part of this story. I don't think we can understand what happens at Marathon if we don't know that everybody thought it was highly possible that there were Athenians who were eager to restore Hippias to the throne and would be willing to engage in treasonous activities or to defect from the democracy and join Hippias if the circumstances were appropriate. So that's in the back of everybody's mind, or in the front. <clears throat> I think when the Persians got there, their strategy included the belief that there would be treason in Athens that would turn the city over to them if the circumstances were right. So that force starts this time, not, not, not along the coast as I told you last time. It takes the shortest route directly across the Aegean Sea, hopping from island to island. <clears throat> Stops at Naxos. Remember, Naxos annoyed the king by successfully resisting Aristagoras' uh, invasion, and they destroy Naxos. Next, they come <clears throat> to the island of Delos in the middle of the Aegean, the island sacred to Apollo and his sister Artemis, a very sacred place indeed for the Greeks. What do the Persians do? They treat the oracle, I'm not the oracle, but they treat the Delians and the priests of Apollo at Delos with great respect, do them no harm. This is typical Persian conquest. They do not impose religions. Their religion is different from that of most of the others in this area. They are Zoroastrians. They are sun worshipers of a certain kind. Uh, and. Uh, but they don't impose their religion, they don't interfere with their religion. They get a very nice write-up in the Old Testament, if you remember, because they don't mistreat the uh, Hebrews, and they particularly don't uh, do them, uh, and compel them to abandon their own religious practices as the other invaders do. So, what, what, is, uh, what, what are the Persians saying by these actions? They are saying, we are not at war with the Greek gods, we're not even at war with the Greeks. We are simply punishing these two miscreant towns that have attacked us. <clears throat> they then turn to the southern tip of the island of Euboea, to the town of Charistus. The Persians may be not at war with the Greeks, but they expect all Greeks who are along the way to behave the way they're supposed to, to the great king. And so they ask the Charistians to give earth and water. The Charistians refuse, and the Persians obliterate uh, their city and take their people into slavery. <clears throat> now they push their way, take their sail along the coast of uh, Euboea to Eretria in the north. <clears throat> and now here are 4,000 Athenians settled there, you remember, in a clerarchy. So right, they, they uh, get their armor on and they stand in front and are prepared to uh, die fighting for the uh, freedom of Eretria because of their wonderful friendship to Athens? Wrong. The 4,000 Athenians go home to Attica. Why? Well, I suppose the immediate answer is why not? <clears throat> but the, uh, it's an embarrassment. And Herodotus, I think we have to realize, is very friendly to Athens all throughout his own history. I doubt that there's, I mean, there's no doubt that he spent time in Athens. He seems to have been a friend of Pericles in later years. He was kindly, although he himself comes from Halicarnassus in uh, Asia Minor. But he did, he did uh, spend a lot of time in Athens, and uh, there seems to be a pro-Athenian caste. One thing also is that many of his um, sources were Athenians who told the story their way. <clears throat> so their answer was the Athenians were ready to fight to save Eretria, but the Eretrians said, there's no point. Why should you get killed too? It's not your town. Why don't you go home? If you can believe that, you can believe anything. But I don't. I think the Athenians realized there was nothing but disaster. If they stayed and they could believe, if we get back to Attica, we might be able to make a contribution to defending our city. Okay, 
So now, here they are at Eretria, the Athenians are gone, it's time for the invasion. The site of the battle, where do they go? Well, they pick Marathon, as I say, in part because it's very near Eretria. Secondly, as Herodotus says, because it's a good place for cavalry. Thirdly, as I've already told you, because it's the stronghold of Pisistratus, the place which would be natural for an army trying to establish Hippias on the throne of Athens. That's why they're there. <clears throat> and their plan, I think, is to go to Marathon. If the Athenians come out and challenge them to a fight, they will crush the Athenians. But they didn't expect that. They thought the Athenians would be afraid. But, and that what would happen is they would stay there in Marathon until they got the news that there was uh, a revolution in Athens prepared to turn the city over to them. That's what Hippias, I think, led them to believe and that's what they hoped for. They were prepared to fight, of course, but they thought it wouldn't be necessary. <clears throat> so on August the 4th, they land in the year 490 at Marathon. We know these dates because there are, uh, uh, is an eclipse associated with this which allows astronomers to fix it pretty precisely. The Athenians, of course, when they knew that the uh, Persians were coming, and that news would have come to them the minute they got to Naxos, then ships would have come to Athens, so the Athenians were well warned, <coughs> went to their new friends, Sparta, to ask them for help, of course. And this is where there are wonderful stories. They sent the great runner, whose name comes down to us in the manuscripts as Phidippides. Chances are his real name was Philippides, but there was an error in the manuscript. But we'll call him Phidippides, because that's what the manuscripts say. <coughs> and uh, <coughs> he, uh, he races uh, to Sparta as fast as he could go. Took him less than two days where he came to the Spartans and he said, the Persians are coming, the Persians are coming, please help us. The Spartans said, we would love to come and help you. Nothing would please us more. Unfortunately, we are in the midst of our holy religious ceremony, the Carnea, and we are not allowed until to leave our hometown until the next full moon, which as a matter of fact is the night of August 11th, 12th. In other words, a whole week after the, the Persians are going to land. I, I, I can't go speculating as to what are we to make of this. Does this mean, is this just an excuse? Are the Spartans serious about this? <clears throat> Our tendency, I suppose, being modern and cynical, would be to say it's only an excuse. I'm more inclined to think that they were sincere about it. It's not that they couldn't find ways to get around such things, but they really took their religion quite seriously, and it may be that, uh, uh, you know, that did play a role. Be that as it may, two things that the Athenians now know. <clears throat> they know the Spartans have promised to come, but not for another week. Both of those things should be uh, on your minds as you try to understand. Now, Herodotus says that the Athenian army marched out from uh, a Athens and went to Marathon, and then they had an argument about what they should do. But I don't think that's right. There must have been a debate. There had to be a debate in Athens. You couldn't take an army out of town without having an assembly to argue the question, should we send an army? And if we should send an army, how big should the army be? And having that decided that, who should be in command? All those things had to be settled by the assembly in Athens. So that's where the debate uh, took place. <clears throat> Some favored defending the city of Athens. Now, we don't know how well the city of Athens was walled, defended by fortification at this time in uh, its history. It may not have had any wall, but I would be surprised. But it certainly did not have a wall that was guaranteed to be effective against an attack. And so I think we should understand that is not going to be successful. To stay home and defend Athens means to allow the Persians to run all around Attica doing anything they want, causing all the harm they could. Remember, something over 75 percent, maybe as many as 90 percent of the Athenians had farms out in the country, and had houses out in the country that would have been exposed <coughs> to the Persians, and so there was good reason for them not to think that was a great idea. 
The alternative was to send an army out to allow the Persians to land because they couldn't stop it. They didn't know where the Persians were gonna come. But as soon as they heard that the Persians had landed, to send an army there and meet them at the place <coughs> of landing. Miltiades emerges as the leading figure here. Not because, I mean, he is a general, but it, that's not the, uh, the only reason. It's because everybody knows Miltiades is the resident Persian expert. He has been a general in the Persian army, and so <clears throat> that gives him a, a, a reason to be listened to, but he's obviously also a person of great merit and quality, proves it at the Battle of Marathon. Uh, he must have been an impressive fellow. So for all these reasons, whatever his formal position was, and I think it was simply one of the generals, de facto, he had much more influence than others for these uh, reasons. And his argument was, let us go out <clears throat> and meet the Persians where they land. And the reasons were, uh, we, we don't want them to be able to get to the Spartans, but uh, beyond that, there was fear that if we stay home and wait and let the Persians do whatever they're going to do, every day that passes increases the danger of treason from those people who want to turn the city over. <clears throat> um, and it's also so completely against the ethic of the Greek warrior, and I would say more specifically the hoplite warrior. You don't let your enemy ravage your countryside. You don't let them destroy your farms. This, in, in a way, goes all the way back to, to Homer, the notion of arete. A man must have courage. He must stand up against an enemy who invades his country. <laughs> and then again, Beyond that, you move to the world of the hoplite, and you're talking about defending your homestead. All of that argued for going out there. So uh, the terminology I would use for modern terminology to explain what the Athenian strategy was to go out and to contain the beachhead. Go out, confront the Persians where they are, don't let them get inland from where they landed. So they do land at Marathon with about 2,500 Infantry. Now remember, their infantry are not hoplites. <clears throat> they do not have heavy armor. There are pictures on uh, wonderful paintings on uh, vases. Yes, sir? Sorry, did you say 2,500? I meant 1,000. I, I hope I, yeah, thanks very much. Um, there, there are vases that show the Persian soldiers at Marathon, and they are wearing uh, pants, as I told you, but they're not carrying any, uh, they're not wearing any armor. And, uh, th their, their shield is a kind of a wicker shield, so that their armament is much inferior to the hoplites. And keep in mind, too, that the Persian army is at always made up of a collection of subject peoples. Yes, there will be some Persians, uh, but there will also be uh, lots of folks who are not Persians in there, so they lack that unity that the Greeks will have. <clears throat> The, um, excuse me, I got this thing a little backwards. Well, never mind. Um, Miltiades' plan is this. <clears throat> there are something like 10,000 Greeks, about 9,000 Athenians, about 1,000 Eretrians, against, let us say, 25,000 Persians. And so uh, as the thing begins, the map here shows you the uh, rough picture of the field at Marathon. Here, uh, the Persians landed right here and had their ships drawn up at this place. They had their camp behind here. This marsh ought to be a little bit more over this way. It's a very serious marsh. It will play an important role in what happens. The Greeks come out. They probably, well, they came marching in through this way. And here we have mountains. This wavy line indicates the line of the mountains. Here you have a really flat plain, but here you have mountains. And somewhere up on the hills here, there was the Greek camp near the modern church of St. Demetrius. This little dot reflects the mound where the dead, the Greek dead at Marathon will, after the battle, be buried. And that is likely to be about the place where the main fighting took place, which helps us to place where the actual battle took place. 
So the, the idea of the, uh, of the uh, Athenians was to try to hold them there as long as they could, but the, the Greeks have the upper hill, the Persians are down below. You, if the Persians want to start a fight, then they ought to come, that they will have to come running up the hill. Well, that is not a very attractive proposition. And so the Greeks feel, let them come for us. It's our country, they're sitting here on the thing, they've got to do something, we don't. Meanwhile, the Persians are waiting for treason so that the city uh, will be surrendered to them. A week goes by with the two sides looking at each other and doing nothing. I always like to compare the Athenian strategy to an old-fashioned um, a football strategy which I haven't seen done now in decades, which used to be kick on first down and wait for a fumble. In other words, let, give the ball to the Persians and let them make a mistake. Uh, I think that's what was in Miltiades' mind. Well, finally, time passes and the Persians realize we can't sit here forever. For one thing, they're going to run out of food and water. For another thing, the great king will want to hear something. Well, how'd you do? What did you do? We sat there and watched the Athenians. No good. <clears throat> so, the plan that the Persians made, I think, was this. That they would take, let us say for the sake of argument, 10,000 troops, put them on the ships, load up the cavalry with, uh, uh, onto the ships too, and send those ships around Attica to come up to Phaleron Bay straight into Athens. And meanwhile, take the 15,000 that are left, march them up to close, as close as you could get to the Greeks, and fix the Greeks there so that they can't go back and defend uh, Athens. So there's no army to protect Athens. So if those guys get off the ships, come sailing into uh, uh, the harbor, walk up to town, it's theirs. If the Athenians are crazy enough from the Persian point of view, to come running down the hill or walking down the hill or whatever into, to be outnumbered three to two by us, and anyway, we're Persians, we always beat Greeks, we got nothing to worry about, then uh, let them do it. So they come. Now, Miltiades is in charge <clears throat> on the day of the battle. He's got the problem that they have 5,000 more troops than he has. He's worried about being outflanked. So what he decides to do is to weaken the depth of his line because he must cover the length of the Persian line. Well, the danger with that is, of course, that when they hit each other, the Persians will break through the Greek line. So he, instead of making it even, he loaded up the wings and left the center even weaker than it would otherwise have been. His hope and strategy was that the Athenians would win on the wings before the Persians could break through the middle, and then the Athenians could turn on the center of the Persians and defeat them. And just barely, that's what happened. <clears throat> the Persians did break through the center, but they were too late. By that time, the, the Greek wing, the Athenian wings, were successful and drove the Persians before them. The Persians ran away like mad, but they ran into the great swamp, and that made their escape much, much more difficult, so the Athenians were able to kill great numbers of them, and uh, <clears throat> finally that, that battle was over. Now the battle was over, let's imagine that it took a couple of hours, that would be a long time. The Athenians had time now to have a meal, take a little rest, and march back across to Attica, which at before the ships could get there, and I like to imagine the scene when uh, it all happened, the Persians coming around the last bend of the bay as they coming to Phaleron, expecting to see a nice empty beach, and seeing the Athenian army, I like to imagine, with their left foot in the breakers and their shields up and their uh, spears up, with the sun gleaming off their shields and blinding the Persians as they came. <clears throat> and at which point you can't force a landing against an army. This can't be done in the ancient world. These guys had to go home and start thinking about what they're going to tell the great king. The Athenians won the battle, a, a very large, very large uh, casualties for the Persians. 
only 192 Greeks killed in the battle and allowed the extraordinary honor of um, being buried on the field where they have fought. Next day, 2,000 Spartans come marching into Attica. That proves they were serious and were told what had happened. They asked permission, can we go to the battlefield and look at it? And there they saw all these dead Persians and no one had ever seen anything like that. No Greeks had ever beat Persians before and great was the glory of the Athenians. So I've described very inadequately and too swiftly the battle. So what? What is the significance of this silly little battle, 10,000 Greeks against 15,000 uh, Persians back a billion years ago? What does it matter? And lots of folks will tell you that, especially these days. But I remember in 1936 there was a, a, a wonderful conference of pacifists uh, who met in England uh, at which the dominant theme uh, of the speakers was no war ever made any difference. What I like about that was that the place of the meeting was Hastings. <clears throat> <laughs> the battle was seen throughout the rest of Greek history, first of all, as a great victory for hoplites as opposed to their opponents. In, in later Greek history, when the Navy, when the Athenian history, when the Navy becomes the big thing, it is the, the party, the old-fashioned, the more conservative party that thinks about Marathon as the great victory, the day that those hoplite farmers saved Greece. The Navy guys, the poor, like to think about Salamis, the naval battle in 480. It was seen as a victory for democracy. It was the Athenian Democrats Later on, I'm sure they were glad the, per the Spartans never got there because they could claim it as their own and as a victory for democracy as well. <clears throat> it was also the first, as I say, Greek defeat of the Persians. As Herodotus says, for up until then, even the name of Persians was a fearful thing for Greeks to hear. It was the source of tremendous national pride and glory for Athens, and scholars have compared the impact of the uh, battle of Marathon on the Athenian image of themselves with the defeat of the Spanish Armada by Elizabeth's English fleet uh, and the beginning of the uh, glory of the Elizabethan era. <clears throat> it was seen as a victory for freedom because the, the price of defeat would have been slavery in every sense as they understood it. Greek civilization, and I'll come back to this in a minute, could have been strangled in its infancy because it is in its infancy. But again, we ought to pay attention to those people who suggest that people like me are over uh, embellishing the significance of all this. One English statesman said, war wins nothing, cures nothing, settles nothing. Speaker was Neville Chamberlain. <clears throat> In 1936, Bertrand Russell, philosopher, declared, disarmament and complete pacifism is indisputably the wisest policy. And he urged the gradual disbanding of the British Army, Navy, and Air Force as Hitler was moving into the Rhineland. <clears throat> Does victory in war make a difference? I would say, ask the losers, the victims, and the survivors of the Holocaust. Ask the descendants of the slaves in the American South. Remember this, if the Athenians had lost at Marathon, Aeschylus had just begun his career as a playwright. Sophocles hadn't written a play. Euripides, of course, hadn't either, nor had Aristophanes. Socrates, if I got this right, yeah, Socrates wasn't born yet, much less Plato, Aristotle, Phidias. There was no Parthenon, none of those glorious buildings that we make us think about the greatness that was Greece had been constructed. There would be no democracy because this was the only place where it had any existence. The scientific revolution, which was almost in beyond its infancy in terms of being new, uh, would have been wiped out. There would be no memory. There would be no record of any of this. 
and therefore no Western civilization, no political freedom. For all these have occurred in no other culture in all the years since that time. That's why I wanted you to know a little bit about the Battle of Marathon, because I think all of us alive today here owe a very great debt to the 10,000 Marathonomachoi, the fighters of Marathon, who fought for Greek freedom and for ours, too. Thank you.